In a world where science and technology are hunting answers to every question humanity has ever asked, the past still has a haunting number of secrets that are yet to be revealed and perhaps would never be exposed. Some are considered the most well-guarded confidences that could still be around, such as the Freemasons and the Illuminati, and some are simply lost to the time. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we're looking back at the most wicked secrets kept throughout the entire history of humanity. The Sibylline Books This may sound like the beginning of a Hollywood movie, but the ancient Romans truly believed that the source of their success and expansion was divine will and magic. They believed that they could foresee every threat and malice that could harm their empire, and thus stop it. The source of mighty magic and foresight they entrusted upon were three ancient books shrouded in myth and mystery. The story begins with Sybil of Cumae an elderly powerful priestess and a prophet of the god Apollo, who was the Greek oracle of the city of Cumae around 500 BC. At that time, Cumae was a Greek colony in the Italian peninsula, and Rome was ruled by Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the power-hungry tyrant. Apart from the cruel and draconic rule that probably included him taking the life of his father, Tarquinius, also known as Tarquin the Proud, is mostly remembered for the construction of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. The other legacy of Tarquin the Proud that lasted for nearly a thousand years was the Sibylline Books. The legend goes that Tarquin the Proud invited the legendary Sibyl of Cumae to Rome either because the city was ravaging with a spreading disease or simply because his greed for power had driven him to seek foresight into his future and plans of his enemies. Sibyl brought nine books with her to Rome, which she claimed to hold prophecies and divination that would help Romans in times of crisis. These books contained a jumbled collection of doomsday predictions, historical allusions, prophecies of the chosen warriors and emperors, and perhaps the password of a certain laptop that has been a hot topic lately. However, Tarquin the Proud was as miser as he was greedy. The price demanded by Sybil was too much for his pride, and he asked for a better deal. Sybil burned three of the nine books and offered the other six to him at a lesser price, but Tarquin the Proud still found the deal too expensive, so Sybil burned three more books and offered the last three. Tarquin the Proud agreed to pay the price of three and asked to put the books in utmost care and security in the very temple of Jupiter. Only he had the authority to consult the books and the custodians put in charge of its care and security were known as Dua Viri Sacris Fatundis. Despite having the foresight guidance of the books, Tarquin couldn't see his banishment from Rome coming, nor did he get any advantage out of them during his multiple attempts to win Rome back. Tarquin died as a sad old man in Cumae, being the last king of Rome, but the books of Sybil stayed in the Temple of Jupiter, now in control of the top leaders of the Roman Republic, who continued consulting the books whenever they felt the need. When Hannibal threatened Rome during the Second Punic War, the books were consulted and the Romans made sacrifices to appease the gods, and eventually they didn't manage to defeat Hannibal. Augustus also used a prophecy in these books to establish himself as the emperor after the civil discourse caused by the demise of Julius Caesar. Yet in 83 BC, when a fire broke out in the Temple of Jupiter, the books were not safe enough to be extracted in time and were destroyed. The Senate had to consult various sibyls and oracles to compile a new set of books that continued to be consulted until the 5th century AD, despite the fact that the Roman Empire turned to Christianity in the 4th century AD. Despite his religious beliefs, Constantine asked for the preservation of the Sibylline books. Still, around the time of the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the books simply disappeared from history and have not been found since. Maybe one day. The Viking Sunstone There's no denying it. The Vikings revolutionized seafaring and their impact changed the course of the history of Europe, maybe the entire world. They crossed the Atlantic centuries before Columbus, their long ships were the omens of doom for mainland Europeans, and their traders sailed to freezing lands, from Russia to the dunes of Baghdad and beyond. But how? How did they do that? On the contrary, to confess, today without GPS would really stink. We wouldn't be able to find the closest market and these men were navigating enormous thalassic journeys in uncharted waters with no compass or maps. Some Icelandic texts have provided us with an answer a sunstone. Normally, to avoid getting lost on their voyages across the North Atlantic, Vikings relied on the sun's position 1100 years ago to determine their heading as it would still take centuries for the Europeans to come up with magnetic compasses. But what if it was a cloudy day? To avoid having their ships sent dangerously off course, 
They employed the use of a sunstone, which worked like a solar compass even when the sun wasn't shining bright in the sky. The Viking sagas mentioned that the sunstone had magical properties that could locate the sun even on cloudy days. If the sunstone really existed, obviously they were the most valuable tool for a Scandinavian sailor, but unfortunately, there are no surviving remnants of this mysterious device. The sagas describe them as fantastical in nature, which makes them appear to be more like a MacGuffin device in the story instead of a real device that was actually never used. A team of scientists claimed that sunstones could have been made of calcite crystals. Even on a cloudy day, the sun still creates concentric rings of polarized lights. So the trick to locating a hidden sun beyond clouds is by detecting polarization. Calcite is a crystal that is found in Iceland and can depolarize light with a property called birefringence. Birefringence makes the passing light split along two paths to create a double image on the far side. Therefore, passing light from the sky through a calcite crystal could determine the location of the rings around the sun. Don't say you didn't learn something today. The Age of the Sphinx For decades, there was a common consensus among historians that Pharaoh Khafre was the person behind the construction of the second largest of the three Great Pyramids of Giza, as well as the Great Sphinx, which is supposed to be the guardian of the Great Pyramids. According to this theory, both the Pyramid and the Sphinx are supposed to be 4,500 years old, but this theory has been challenged since the 19th century. Most historians who are not buying the Khafre theory have argued that despite the fact that the Sphinx and the Pyramids are built in the same complex, no contemporary inscription links him with a statue that is supposed to have the face of the great pharaoh. Since the 1990s, a new theory has challenged the date of the construction by a huge margin and proposed that the Sphinx is at least twice as old as it is considered. This hypothesis is supported by the presence of extensive corrosion of the limestone near the top of the Great Sphinx that could be caused by water and the last time heavy rainfall occurred in Giza would have been around 7000 BC. Talk about a drought. This assumption has led to the conclusion that an equally advanced civilization predated the Egyptian civilization by a few millennia. Although most historians think that this theory doesn't account for all the evidence presented by the statue itself, there is one piece of evidence that strongly argues for it. The proportion of the head to the rest of the statue happens to be a mismatch. Theorists who support the water erosion theory claim that Pharaoh Khafre must have ordered the recarving of the head of the Sphinx to match his likeness, and the original head was of the lion. Although the head of a lion or jackal would indeed have been proportionate with the rest of the body, it is quite likely that the Sphinx was carved out of a huge rock of limestone and the laborers of the 25th century BC worked with what they had. There is also the matter of the hidden tunnels inside the Sphinx. Over the years, many shafts and tunnels have been either discovered or dug to find fabled hidden passages in the Great Sphinx. The legend goes that like the Great Library of Alexandria, the Sphinx hides an even more ancient library underneath the Sphinx that predates the Old Kingdom of Egypt called the Hall of Records. However, most of these tunnels and shafts have ended in a dead end or turned out to be works of treasure hunters of antiquity. A certain gap behind the Sphinx's right ear has led to the rumors that underneath the ear of the Sphinx, there could possibly be a lever that unlocks the way to the Hall of Records. Famed Egyptologist Dr. Zahi Hawass has dismissed all these theories, but one cannot deny that before Napoleon's archaeologists discovered Sphinx, it was entirely buried in the desert. Could it be possible that the Hall of Records is also buried deep in the desert? Skull and Bones Today, the name Geronimo is an internet meme thanks to the witty and amusing movie The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But the name holds a certain dignity in Native American history. It belongs to a fearless and resilient Apache outlaw who became the symbol of Native American resistance against Mexican and United States authority. However, if the legend is to be believed, his remains are also the founding stone of the secret society that has played an important role in the 20th and 21st century history of the U.S. and every other country that has been affected by the United States foreign policy from the shadows. The story begins in 1918 when allegedly a then Yale student named Prescott S. Bush exhumed the remains of Geronimo in the dark shroud of night and used his skull and two bones to create the symbol of a secret society called Skull and Bones, but it is also known as the Order, the Order 322, and the Brotherhood of Death. Prescott S. Bush later became the father and grandfather of two separate United States presidents. The founders of Skull and Bones were Alfonso Taft, whose son would also become president of the United States, and William Huntington Russell. The members of this society are known as Bonesmen, and all the U.S. presidents we have mentioned just now were also Bonesmen. Hundreds of government officials, senators, cabinet members, as well as members of the entertainment industry, such as actor Paul Giamatti, happened to be Bonesmen. 
As so many members become quite influential, many tinfoil hat wearers happen to make connections between them and their interpretations of world events, which they always see through some dark sunglasses. However, if the Bonesmen are not some sort of hidden world order, what do they do? Aside from notable alumni and a few legends, not much is known about the elusive society. Also, they call their headquarters at Yale University the Tomb, and they generally have a very gothic vibe about their proceedings, which could be mistaken for cults' processions. They have been accused of being the driving force behind the creation of the nuclear bomb, also for being a subsidiary of the Illuminati, and being involved in the elimination of an American leader. These theories have often been flamed by the facts that certain Bonesmen have been the most influential people in the history of the U.S. as being in charge of the Rockefeller State, the Carnegie's, the Ford Company's, Time Magazine, and of course being in government positions. Yet, when asked about what goes on inside the tomb, the entire membership has remained tight-lipped stating they can't reveal the secret. W mentioned in his autobiography that he cannot even talk about that part of his life. The Dogu In 1998, an American Orientalist and zoologist named Edward S. Morse found the first pieces of pottery in Japan that belonged to the prehistoric times of Japan, now called the Joman period. In fact, Morse was the person who came up with the name Joman, which means cord marked as the pottery he found was decorated by pressing cords into the wet clay to form textures. The Joman period is a humongous unrecorded time in Japanese history that spans from 14,000 BC to 300 BC. That is even longer than the ancient Egyptians' history. The problem is that writing wasn't invented in the Japanese archipelago until 600 AD. We know next to nothing about the hunter-gatherers Joman people of Japan, which makes their pottery figurines so mysterious. Dogu figurines are small in size, ranging from 4 to 11 inches, and most of them appear to be feminine in shape. Common features include big beady eyes, small waist, and wide hips, and sometimes they are fashioning a large belly, perhaps to appear as a pregnant woman. Coincidentally, that imagery has a lot of commonalities with other Neolithic figures, such as the Venus of Willendorf, which has led archaeologists to believe that these figurines also represent a mother goddess and were used in rituals and practices related to fertility and motherhood. Others believe that dogu were made and kept by the Joman women for some secret ritual of womanhood and carnal activities, or it was perhaps concerned with death and funerals, but the lack of evidence or written records has made it near impossible to ever decode this secret. Tell us in the comments if you have any theories about these secrets. And thanks for watching Nutty History. Please like and share the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to watch more videos.